is really the second major event in the historical section of Isaiah that we find in these four chapters. The first concerns this tremendous assault of Sennacherib and Assyria upon God's people and teaches us a great deal as we were trying to learn last Wednesday evening about how to face the assaults of the enemies of God and his people. And we saw some of the lessons that are to be derived from chapters 36 and 37 uh, last Wednesday. But this uh, particular section that we turn to this evening is the second main event on which Isaiah focuses, and it is a personal event. It is the personal experience of Hezekiah the king that he is suddenly faced with this dreadful situation that at the age of 39, as we calculate that he would have been at the time, he suddenly is told that he is confronting early death, that the illness from which he suffers is fatal, because that's the whole point of the intimation that comes to him at the beginning of the chapter. This is a fatal illness. There is no ordinary cure. And here at this moment in his life when he, as we realize later, describes himself in verse 10 as being in the prime of life, he didn't imagine that life was going to be fragile at this stage of his experience. And yet he is faced with this desperate news that comes to him in the end of verse 1. This is what the Lord says, put your house in order because you are going to die. You will not recover. So the chapter becomes, therefore, a lesson on dealing with personal catastrophe, the sort of thing that, like Hezekiah, we would probably never have imagined could possibly happen. And uh, Hezekiah has certain things that he, was, he teaches us uh, in this context. You can just imagine what it must have been like when uh, he took ill and felt himself to be so desperately unwell. And then Isaiah comes to him with what must have seemed like a pronouncement of personal doom. Put your house in order, the Lord says, because you are going to die, you will not recover. Now, that made the situation worse for Hezekiah um, in a particular sense. Um, I think that what he is meaning when he says, put your house in order, is deal with your personal affairs. We use the phrase, I think, don't we still, uh, we need to put our house in order, we say, the kind of thing I had a rather vivid illustration of just this morning when we were having coffee in my study and my wife looked up at the boxes of files that were on the top shelf of my study and she said to me, you know, if anything happened to us, the family would have a terrible amount of rubbish to clear out here. I think what she was really saying to me was, we need to put your house in order anyway. Uh, but that, that really is the point of it. But particularly for Hezekiah, it meant not just clearing his effects into an orderly fashion, but seeing to the succession on the throne. Now, that's a special thing for him, you see. And the simple fact was he didn't have a successor. If you read through the history of this particular section of Isaiah, you will see that when Manasseh, his son, came to the throne, he was 12. Now, that means that he was born within the 15 extra years that Hezekiah was given by God. And therefore, at this point, he had no heir. 
And as we'll see in a moment, that really was a serious thing for Hezekiah because he was of the lineage of David. It wasn't just for the sake of the family pride of maintaining his line. He was of the lineage of David. And we were waiting for great David's greater son to be born. The Messiah was to come from the lineage of David. And I have little doubt that part of Hezekiah's bewilderment at these events was in this whole realm. Put your house in order, God said to him. Now, what was to happen to the house of Hezekiah and to the lineage and the promise of God? So it was a very particularly poignant moment for him. Now, What then was Hezekiah's response? Well, do you notice that again in verse 2, he quite specifically turns away from all human resources to seek the face and consolation of God. Now, that's consistent with the whole message of Isaiah. As you will remember, we've been finding again and again The message is, trust in the Lord, not in man. Do not put your confidence in alliances with the flesh. Trust in the Lord. Now, when Hezekiah turns his face to the wall, I don't think he's going in the huff, as some suggest. I don't think he's turning round petulantly to say, God has let me down. I think what he is doing is turning away from every other consideration to enable him to concentrate on seeking the grace and consolations of God in his supreme hour of crisis, because this most certainly was that kind of hour. And then the second thing that happens, you notice, is that he pours out his heart to God and reflects before him on the quality of his life. Now, that's what a man usually does when he is faced with this whole question of the termination of his life, the early termination of it in his case. But whenever that happens, you know how people will often say to you, the whole of my past suddenly poured into my mind and thinking at this hour. And Hezekiah is reviewing his life before God. And it is a very wonderful thing, as I was hinting in the reading, that here you find a man who reflects before God on his life and on the things that have really been important to him. And here he sets before God that a man should be able to do this in the presence of God. Is this not remarkable? He says, remember, O Lord, how I have walked before you faithfully and with wholehearted devotion, and have done what is good in your eyes. Now, I do not think that Hezekiah is pleading with God on the basis of his righteous behavior that he will receive some reward for services rendered, as it were. I think what Hezekiah is doing is reflecting on the whole of his life. And out of a true heart, now this is the important thing, Out of a true heart, he is coming to God with all the bitterness of his tears and all the anguish of his soul. But he is reviewing his life and is able to come to God and say, I've walked before you faithfully and with wholehearted devotion and have done what is good in your eyes. And we need to come to God straight out of his word and say to him, Lord, that I might end my days like that, whether the end comes gradually or suddenly, that I might be able thus to reflect at the end of my days, I have walked before you faithfully. With my whole heart I have been devoted to you, and I have done what is good in your sight. Now that is the testimony of a man of Hezekiah's quality.
But then he also expresses his emotions to God. Do you notice it is to God that every area of his life is turned now? He reflects upon his past. He brings his emotions and pours out his tears before God. And do you notice that when God has, is hearing him in verse uh, 5, he says, I have heard your prayer and seen your tears. And I am sure that that's partly because Hezekiah's great concern was not just for himself, but for the honor of God, the cause of God, and the lineage that had not yet appeared. And so he pours out his heart to the Lord. There's an extension of this in Hezekiah's psalm from verse 10 uh, to verse 14, where Hezekiah brings to God the things that puzzle him in this catastrophic experience. Now, he does not hide them, you see. He is pouring out everything that is on his soul before God. It's a great model of prayer, this, if you think it through uh, in, in greater leisure. He said, in the prime of my life must I go through the gates of death and be robbed of the rest of my years. Here is a man naturally acknowledging that he is still in his youth, as it were. And yet this appalling news has come to him that he will die and not live. And so he brings to God this complaint as it were in the prime of my life must I go through the gates of death and be robbed of the rest of my years and then he bemoans before God not only his youthfulness but his distaste for death he does not pretend for a moment that the thing is going to be enjoyable to him that's a very important thing even at the level of psychology, it's of great importance for somebody to be able to get that out of their system and to express it and articulate it. Notice what he says, I will not again see the Lord in the land of the living. Now scholars think that he is speaking about entering into the temple to worship. And in the sense in which he sees the face of God to be gathered with God's people, he says, here is something that I'm never going to experience again. And neither in the second half of verse 11 will I look on mankind or be with those who now dwell in this world. That is, he is recognizing the natural pain at the idea of being deprived of all the pleasures that he enjoys in this world. The society of his friends, the fellowship of God's people. He does not want to lose that. Now, that's a real and godly attitude for a man to have. That's not an unnatural or unspiritual thing for him to say. Oh, you say, but doesn't the Apostle Paul say, I would rather depart and be with Christ? Yes, well, we'll come to that in a moment because the Apostle Paul is writing, of course, within the context of the New Testament and after the resurrection and you will see that here there is less awareness of what that all means than there is for example in 1 Corinthians 15 but nonetheless it is a natural thing for someone like Hezekiah to say I do not want to lose the blessings and benefits of this earthly life. I long, he says, still to be able to be in the land of the living. And then he spreads out before God his anguish at the thought of his tent being pulled down and taken from me as he describes it picturesquely in verse 12 and uses the same figure that we use when we speak of somebody being prematurely cut off. You notice he says, he has cut me off from the loom like a weaver with a, a rolled up piece of cloth. 
And it is cut off. This, he says, is how I feel. And so he cries to the Lord about the natural anguish in his heart about dying. And that's very real, you know. And it is unrealistic for us to imagine that somebody enjoys the idea at this stage of life of leaving his loved ones behind him. Of course he doesn't. And I have sometimes spoken to people, Christian people, who have been in the midst of this kind of situation that Hezekiah was in. And they have said to me, you know, it really worries me greatly that I, I feel as I do. I'm sure I ought to feel that I would far rather depart and go to heaven. And he has a family of children around him and people he loves and cares for. Now, Hezekiah is expressing something which is very real and very natural and is something to be held alongside this other concern which the Apostle Paul describes to us. So he cries out to God, acknowledging the many agonies of his soul in verses 13 and 14. I waited patiently till dawn but like a lion he broke all my bones. Now great anguish, especially in the Psalms, is described as the breaking of bones. It's not like the physical breaking of bones, but it is this excruciating experience of great anguish. Day and night you made an end of me. And he acknowledges, I cried like a swifter thrush. I moaned like a mourning dove. My eyes grew weak as I looked to the heavens. I am troubled. O oh Lord, come to my aid. And the Lord heard him and came to his aid. But if ever a man prayed and cried to God and just opened his heart to him, it was Hezekiah at this hour. Now I'll tell you the other thing that they did. Not only did Hezekiah pray and cry to God and plead with him and set forth as it were the various things that were like arguments in his soul why he should continue to live. But he used the God-ordained means of whatever medical science existed in his day and put a poultice on the boils that he was suffering from. Verse 21, Isaiah had said, now if you look at the record of this in uh, 1 Kings, uh, 2 Kings rather, chapter 20, you'll see that what Isaiah gives us as a postscript, uh, the writer of 2 Kings puts right in the middle of the account. That is, he tells us that it happens... Uh, just after uh, Hezekiah had prayed. But he says, prepare a poultice of figs. If you want to look back to 2 Kings 20, which I see some of you are doing, uh, let me point it out to you. Um, verse 7, Then Isaiah said, prepare a poultice of figs. They did so and applied it to the boil and he recovered. It seems that whatever kind of illness uh, Hezekiah was suffering from, one of the symptoms of it was eruptions of boils on his skin. The commonest view is that it was septicemia that he was suffering from, and there were these huge boils, and the common thing to do in the medical treatment for that kind of condition in these days was to poultice them. And that's exactly what they did. So do you notice the two sides? Hezekiah cries out to God. Isaiah comes and tells him God has heard him. But God also uses means for his healing. And the means he uses is the medical science of the day. And uh, Isaiah said, prepare a poultice of figs and apply it to the boil and he will recover. 
And then God responds to his prayer. In verse 4 of Isaiah 38, Then the word of the Lord came to Isaiah, Go and tell Hezekiah, This is what the Lord, the God of your father David, says, I have heard your prayer and seen your tears. I will add 15 years to your life, and I will deliver you and this city from the hand of the king of Assyria. I will defend this city. And uh, he then goes on to give them the sign, because again, as we read in the last verse of the chapter, Hezekiah had asked, what will be the sign that I will go up to the temple of the Lord, that is, that I will recover again. And uh, God sends this gracious word of healing. Um, let me point out to you that some people have expressed a problem about this particular part of the story. That is, that God sends Isaiah to Hezekiah in the first place and says to him, this is what the Lord says, put your house in order because you're going to die, you will not recover. Then Hezekiah prays and God sends Isaiah again and says, this is what the Lord, the God of your father says, I have heard your prayer and seen your tears, I'll add 15 years to your life and deliver you and the city and so on. Now they say, is this God then changing his mind? Is this God setting himself to do one thing? Then somebody prays and God changes his mind. Well now, I think that it is rather than that, it is all part of God's sovereign purpose to do two things. The first of them is this. It is to fulfill his covenant with David. Because in verse 5 we read, and this is the ground on which God is gracious to Hezekiah, this is what the Lord, the God of your father David says. I have heard your prayer and seen your tears. I will add 15 years to your life. And during that time, Manasseh is going to be born and the, uh, the future for the kingdom is going to be assured. And I will deliver you in this city from the hand of the king of Assyria. Now, that fulfillment of God's covenant promise to David is of cardinal importance because it goes right through to Christ. And what God is saying here through Isaiah to Hezekiah is that he is going to fulfill his covenant to David so that in the fullness of time, great David's greater son would be born and the people of God would be redeemed out of a bondage infinitely worse than their bondage to Sennacherib or Babylon. But the bondage of sin and Jesus, the coming Emmanuel, would do that. But he would be, as you will remember, we often read at Christmas time, he would be of the house and lineage of David. Now God is here securing that lineage. Now, of course, Hezekiah was facing an illness that was fatal. And it would not have taken even Isaiah to come and tell him that God is confronting him with the reality of this fatal illness. But then do you notice the second thing that God has a purpose to do? And that is to benefit Hezekiah. Look at verse 17. Surely it was for my benefit that I suffered such anguish. And then he goes on to speak to God about that. But the really important thing is, you see, that God is doing two things. 
He is sovereignly riding through Hezekiah's personal situation as he sovereignly rode through the national situation of Judah. He is overruling these circumstances and his covenant promise to David stands whatever. And here he says, now he is fulfilling that promise and he is also benefiting Hezekiah who himself confesses it was for my benefit that I suffered such anguish. So Hezekiah returns to give God all the honor and glory for what he has done uh, from verse 15 onwards and we can see some of the benefit that was wrought in Hezekiah's own life. What can I say, he says. Now, he is standing back, you see, as a man who has experienced the grace and power of God at work in his life. He is almost like Paul in Romans 8 saying, what shall we say to these things? He says, this is the condition that I was in in the first half of his psalm or song or writing. He says, this is the condition I was in, but God has come. What shall I say about this? Well, he says, he has spoken to me, and he himself has done this. Now, what is it that God has done? He has produced certain things in Hezekiah, and Hezekiah gives himself to this quality of life. Verse 15, to a humble walk with God. He has spoken to me, and he himself has done this. I will walk humbly all my years because of this anguish of my soul. Now you know that is simply the testimony of many people who have been brought as low as Hezekiah was who have faced the awesome realities that he faced on that occasion and have been snatched out of them. Now, that does not always happen. But for those who have been snatched out of such a situation and have discovered the grace of God and found his mercy in providing 15 years like Hezekiah or whenever, who have pro- when God has prolonged their days, then something has been wrought in their soul. And Hezekiah says, I will walk humbly all my years because of this anguish of my soul. And it does produce that kind of spirit, does it not, by God's grace, this sort of experience when a man or woman has been brought low before God like this, when everything, as it were, has been stripped away from them and they are facing that final moment of their earthly life, they have been brought to see what Hezekiah saw when he cried to God, I am troubled, O Lord, come to my aid. And God came and took him up in his mercy and healed him. Now that response is the very first thing. A humble walk with God for the rest of his days. I do believe with all my heart that God has often gone to great lengths in the lives of his children in order to produce precisely that. It is because that spirit is so precious to God in his people that he will do almost anything to produce it. And Hezekiah says, I will walk humbly all my years because of this anguish of my soul. Then verse 16 He speaks of the thankful heart that God has given to him. Lord, by such things men live, and my spirit finds life in them too. 
you restored me to health and let me live. And he is praising God for that. The third thing that has been worked into his life is a reflective mind. Notice verse 17, Surely it was for my benefit that I suffered such anguish. In your love you kept me from the pit of destruction. You have put all my sins behind your back. He is reflecting, in other words, on what God has wrought within his life and character. He sees the things that were mysteries in the past. He begins, he begins to understand now. It was for my benefit. But you notice that he is going on in verse 18 and 19 to express this spirit that seems rather strange to us. As I say simply, I think, because uh, Hezekiah is speaking on the other side of that glorious evidence we have of the triumph of God over death in Jesus Christ and the power of God to make even the grave a place of victory. But you would not expect Hezekiah to see that in the same sense, would you? For the grave cannot praise you. Death cannot sing your praise. Those who go down to Sheol cannot hope for your faithfulness. The living, it is the living who praise you. As I am doing today, fathers tell their children about your faithfulness. Now, of course, that is perfectly true. The living do praise God as Hezekiah is doing. Fathers are intended to look back and tell their children of the faithfulness of God. I am sure Hezekiah did that with Manasseh, for example that he spoke to him and told him of the faithfulness and mercy of God when he was in this day of deep distress. And he is saying, I am thankful to God to have lived to that point. But of course we know that even the grave has been conquered and God has made death his subject and there is hope that is glorious and beyond anything that Hezekiah would have been able to see clearly in the glory. And then he has an assurance of the future, you notice, in verse 20. The Lord will save me, and we will sing with stringed instruments all the days of our lives in the temple of the Lord. So the great characteristic of his life is to be the praise and worship and adoration of God. It's a very interesting thing that uh, some scholars think that when Hezekiah is saying in verse 11, I will not again see the Lord in the land of the living, he is speaking about the glorious blessing and benefit of worshiping God together with his people. And the thing that he is going to miss most if he is to die is that. Now it's a very significant thing that that was what he was going to miss most of all. But it's also very significant that when God has raised him up again, he does not forget the Lord, which is the great danger, isn't it? You know, I have seen people whom God has brought through some disastrously painful experience, and then when they have been raised up, they have done what God has constantly said to his people not to do. Do not forget the Lord who brought you up out of the land of Egypt. And they have forgotten him. But Hezekiah says, the Lord will save me. It's not just that he has done, he will. So it has added strength and fiber and character to his future. And we will sing with stringed instruments all the days of our lives in the temple of the Lord.
a glorious testimony that comes from Israel's leader and how greatly we need to learn from him about going through days of great personal crisis as Hezekiah was doing and God brought him through and made a better man of him through it. Now let's pray together. Our gracious Father, we thank you that in all the trials of our daily lives, your word speaks to our ultimate need. And we pray that you would touch our hearts this evening afresh by your Holy Spirit, so that by your grace we may be prepared for days of trial and for anguish of heart, and that we may turn from every other ground of hope to the Lord. Hear our prayer. Bless us as we part from one another, and may your grace and mercy and peace be our portion this night and forevermore. Amen.